Thanks. Hi again, everyone. Um, so I introduced myself first briefly uh, earlier on. My name is Mark Phillips. I work at the Center of Genomics and Policy at McGill University um, in Montreal. Um, as I mentioned, so I have a background in computer science going a ways back, worked as a computer programmer for a while, then went back to school, went to law school, became a lawyer. Um, and I look a lot at uh, issues of privacy, data protection, um, uh, some other ethical issues. Uh, and you may have noticed already that I have not mentioned life sciences anywhere in any of those qualifications. I have no formal training in life sciences, but I've picked up quite a bit up uh, as I've gone along. So I'm going to try to stay somewhat in my lane. I think it seems that this field is like increasingly interdisciplinary with um, the computer science, especially with talking about the ethics stuff. Um, so I'll be talking partly about some of the um, legal ethical issues involved, uh, partly about a bit of... Uh, background into cloud, uh, cloud computing, et cetera, uh, using virtual machines, starting to move into the more practical um, aspect of this whole workshop. Um, but yeah, that will be the, f that will be, uh, the focus. I'm not going to try to uh, lay out specific rules of exactly what you need to do, uh, because obviously this field is developing and emerging really rapidly. There's a lot of debate and uh, to some degree confusion about what's happening. And so my, my goal is going to be to try to raise the different eth ethical issues help you to be able to uh, notice when there's one kind of in play, be able to discuss more with others when things come up. So that's the idea. Uh, I've listed a few objectives, uh, kind of what I've already probably discussed. So um, understand the importance of the cloud for genomic research, identify the legal issues, and then we'll talk a bit more specifically about SSH's use to interact with virtual machines, which will be kind of the first step of um, some of the work you'll be doing this week. So I've kind of broken it up into four sections. This first section is um, kind of the cloud portion. So in the field, we're noticing kind of a huge move into the cloud. Um, this is first thing is, uh, that comes up is a report from um, the European Commission. They're planning on building what they're calling the uh, Open Science Cloud. Uh, that's going to kind of link existing uh, infrastructures in Europe to, to allow for medical research in, in Chicago. There's an initiative you might be aware of called the Genomic Data Commons um, that's more, more genomic uh, science specific. And a similar project that's the one that we're going to be primarily working with uh, this week um, out of Canada, but it's an international project called the Cancer Genome Collaboratory. Um, and these projects have really been pushed by um, the increasing amounts of genomic data as it's becoming increasingly difficult for uh, researchers to use to, to analyze, download, share, et cetera, um, work, you know, let alone on their own laptop, even on um, university high-performance computing centers. Um, and there's other, there's other reasons as well that delve into some of the, the legal and ethical reasons why um, researchers also would like to have control of their own infrastructures and be able to establish, uh, you know, the rules and procedures of how they work. So first question, what... Um, what are we talking about when we're talking about the cloud? Um, just to kind of lay out the baseline. Um, the m kind of most common definition you'll see cited is from the US National Institute of Standards and T Technology. What they say is um, that cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. And there's some examples, network servers, storage, applications, and services that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction, which is, I mean, so you see a lot of words like ubiquitous, ubiquity, convenience, uh, rapidity, and minimality of management, which in my mind are not very, I mean, they're, they're open to interpretation. And so to me, this whole definition, I mean, it does say quite a bit, but at first it can be a bit confusing. What exactly does this mean? What counts? What, what doesn't? So um, another way people tend to think about it is, and this kind of breaks down some of the elements that you saw in that previous definition, is uh, breaking down what cloud computing means into a few of its essential characteristics. So when we talk about on-demand self-service, we're thinking about not having to interact with a person to set up a new, a new account, a new system. It's convenient and that way you can kind of do it yourself. Broad network access, meaning you can access it from a variety of places, not necessarily the entire internet, but it, often it, it is you can access, uh, access the cloud you know, from your, your phone, from your laptop, et cetera. But it could be within you know, a larger scale, uh, wide area, more private network, et cetera. Uh, when we're talking about resource pooling, uh, what's meant there is it's, it's often kind of um, similar, uh, similar to the idea that these are multi-client uh, 
services where you might be running a virtual machine that seems to be all your own in the cloud and, and is all your own, but it might be running actually on the same physical system as someone else's software. Um, these services are shared or serving a bunch of different people. Usually that's not a problem. In, in rare cases, there can be uh, difficulty related to that. Um, uh, so rapid elasticity is the next one, so you can easily scale up and scale down what you're doing in terms of both the, the storage you're using for your projects, but also the amount of computing power, the amount of memory, etc., which um, is different from a, c a conventional um, kind of setup. If you're running, say, an academic computing center, when you're not using it, it's kind of sitting there idle, you've paid for it, uh, yeah, you're, you're having to maintain it anyways, whereas in the cloud there's this idea, at least, that you pay only for what you use. Um, which is um, related a bit then to the last characteristic I've got here, which is uh, measured surface service, the idea that uh, what people are doing is being measured, not, not only for billing purposes, obviously, um, but not only for billing purposes, also to try to figure out uh, how to optimize the use for quality of service, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are just kind of some of the, the basic notions that people are talk about whenever cloud computing gets brought up that's good to, that are good to familiarize or re-familiarize yourself with so that when they're discussed, uh, it's clear. So people t generally talk about three different service models that can be provided by um, cloud providers. They kind of range, they're kind of on a continuum. So infrastructure as a service is any kind of uh, cloud provision that's giving you pretty much raw resources, either close to raw storage space or raw compute power or raw memory or some combination thereof. The opposite end of the spectrum is the bottom one, software as a service, which would be things you're used to maybe viewing through a browser. If you're using viewing your webmail through a browser, you don't have, it is still a cloud service. You don't know exactly where uh, your data is being stored, how it's being sent to you, but you don't have, you have control only through a very limited portal. Uh, the platform as a service, mo a service model is somewhere in between where there's some, some tools or pipelines that you have access to, but it's still a kind of a lower level. So what we're going to be working with this week is pretty much the first two layers. So um, infrastructure as a service kind of in the sense that we can fire up virtual machines that we can do pretty much whatever we want with, uh, but we also have some, we can draw on an a existing uh, library of analytic pipelines and tools that are platform-like. Uh, you'll also hear people talk about the different deployment models um, as far as the cloud that, that exists. So the first two are public and private cloud, and to some degree those might be, uh, or at least I find them counterintuitive as far as what you might think. Public, when we often think of public services, you think of, or at least I think of something being provided by the state. Um, but this is kind of really the op opposite. Pub public cloud, we're usually talking about things like Amazon that are made available to anyone, um, whereas private clouds are more made available to, there are clouds that have been built for a specific, purposes, for a specific purpose. Um, Another deployment model is uh, the community cloud, which might fit in. Uh, Francis? Those are often academic, right? Yeah. The private ones are academic and the public ones are commercial. Yeah, or you could think of, yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Was there, was there another question here? Or you, no. Um, yeah, so I was, I was thinking that the collaboratory project would fit more in the community cloud, where it's groups of people that have gotten together. But would you say that's more private, than what we're working with here? Well, it's, it's, a, it's an academic, it's, an, it's, it's a orthogonal. I think the collaboratory is public in the sense that it's publicly accessible. Mm. Right? You'll see it in the cloud, it's not hidden behind a firewall or anything like that. So it's public that way, so it can be seen, but it is a, it's not a commercial, but it's slightly commercial. So that's mm -hmm. sort of difficult uh, caveat to make, but it's but it's it's run by an, an academic group as well. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of these things kind of uh yeah, defy categorization, but I, I find it still helpful to, because the terms are thrown around quite a lot, I feel it's helpful to orient to them. So I'll kind of quickly go through this, but just again to remember why we might, in a, kind of a different context, why we might want to be doing this, why, what's pushing the drive to the cloud. So um, traditionally, I think mean, email is kind of, I think, what I and a lot of people first became oriented to it to the cloud through, and the whole idea is you can connect to a machine from anywhere. It got rid of the previous paradigm where you had to fill in a bunch of information about who is your... Um, you know, what port are you connecting to? What's your SMTP service? Um, if you send a file that's too big, it's going to get an attachment that's too big, it's going to get sent back. This all became kind of outdated. Uh, and people using these services, uh, the, the 
kind of the short, very short, quick list of the benefits are that it's easy, cheap, uh, and powerful. Um, and so you can see in a context like the one we're in um, with the International Cancer Genome Consortium, where we have um, groups from all around the world who are uh, sequencing data, analyzing data, sharing data, very quickly that these data sets become very large. It becomes very difficult to do, as I mentioned, uh, on your own machine, let alone an academic computer computing center. And so this is one of the, the reasons that people are turning to the cloud. And similarly, it's not just the size of data, but similarly, if you've got, um, this is a slide I've poured from uh, a colleague at OCR. Um, if you've got kind of these sets of data in different parts of the world that are quite large sets of genomic data, the goal is to kind of do something similar here. To be able to have a kind of harmonized portal, this is through kind of ICGC Argo project, uh, including also clinical data, to be able to, in the same way, from wherever you are on your laptop, connect to it um, without having to spend uh, hours, weeks, or months downloading all this data to a local machine over very slow, slow links. Uh, and then also to have uh, the analytic tools and pipelines you need that are already kind of, many of which are already pre-built pre for you. You can um, combine them as you like. Um, here we've got, um, getting more into the ethical legal side of things, uh, data access control, uh, compliance uh, approvals, because often to have access to um, different data sets, you need to go through some kind of process to get approval as being a kind of bona fide researcher, et cetera, et cetera. So with your authorizations, then the idea is to make it simple to run a specific analytic pipeline across all the donors in the different clouds. Um, uh, of a specific kind and uh, and to be able to do this conveniently from wherever you are. So this is kind of the, the, where, where things are headed, where we're trying to get to. Uh, this is an, another slide that's kind of trying to show um, the benefits of the cloud over academic computing centers. Um, according, this, this came out uh, in an article a few years ago. It's trying to make the case that um, the cloud is needed now. Um, there's still, I think, a fair amount of, there's still a lot of people working in academic data centers, obviously. Um, in practice, I don't know if people have had experience, but my sense is that things are still a bit more even, but it's quite possible, the trend seems to be towards the cloud. Um, so this, the collaboratory um, kind of infrastructure that we're working with this week is built based on OpenStack, which is uh, an open source uh, kind of cloud infrastructure uh, that allow us to do things like fire up virtual machines. The reason we use virtual machines is it's basically an idea, uh, if people, whether people are familiar with it already or not, I'm not sure, but you're, you can fire up, say, an instance of a certain operating system running, say, Linux Ubuntu. You can tell it, I want so, so, to run on so and so many processors, to have, have so many um, megabytes or terabytes or, or gigabytes of, of storage space. Um, it can be, and it, they can be created basically instantly and remotely from wherever you are without having to have um, have access to the actual power near you. So a lot of what we'll be doing is uh, being able to fire up. There's kind of a web interface of the OpenStack stuff that's been um, customized a bit by the collaboratory people. You'll be able to fire up um, a virtual machine in the cloud, and then through basically a kind of command line or other in interface, we'll be connecting to that uh, securely so that no one else can kind of listen in, no one can uh, intrude on what we're doing. So I'll move into... Um, kind of the second aspect, which starts to raise some of the uh, privacy, ethical, legal issues. Um, in the broader context, what we've been seeing in recent years, especially in healthcare, is, but if you've been following probably the news at all, I mean, information security is probably something that you're, you're aware of. We've seen a kind of wave after wave of uh, seem to be tectonic uh, things, everything from, you know, from uh, if people are familiar with ran ransomware that's been growing over the last few years, the idea is that these uh, malicious software that will uh, be implanted into your computer, encrypt your entire uh, machines, you can't read anything, and then will demand a ransom out of you, usually uh, in Bitcoin, and you're, you won't be able to get any of your data back until you pay the ransom. And there's been large institutions that have fallen prey to this, um, uh, but but not only this, we've seen kind of with wireless networking, this was a huge WPA2 um, uh, vulnerability disclosed six months ago. There were, you know, Spectre, um, kind of wave after wave of, of large breaches, large vulnerabilities disclosed. Healthcare has seen a huge amount um, uh, of breaches. Uh, obviously, it's something that's getting closer. On the research side, um, there have been breaches, problems, but they've been to a much smaller degree. There's been very, very few, far fewer high-profile breaches uh, until now. 
But I mean, my suspicion is as now there's starting to be more and more integration between research and clinical data, as we're seeing and talking about, uh, as people need to rely on clinical data in order to figure out what the significance of different variants is, there's uh, at least the risk that things could, um, um, things could go more in this direction. And so um, this is the slide. I don't want to feel like, a, you know, a, we're in a high school class and I'm a police officer talking to you about the dangers of drugs, et cetera. But, um, but so in, in the U.S., there's a law called HIPAA. I'm not sure if people are familiar with it or have heard of it before. It's uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So different countries in the world have really different approaches to privacy law. This is one of the big important ones in the U.S. And it's the, one of the things about it is, is that it's health specific. And so I should back up. It's not actually a privacy law. As it, you can tell by the name, it talks about health insurance and portability rather than privacy. But a few years after it came into effect, there was, there's uh, an aspect of it that was added in called the privacy rule that has, um, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive uh, framework on dealing with uh, the privacy of health information. Explicitly, it's supposed to deal with clinical data, but when that clinical data gets shared with researchers, that data is still subject to this law called HIPAA. Uh, it's enforced by uh, the Office for Civil Rights here in the US. Uh, there's been big, uh, coming out of some of the breaches, there's been a lot of big kind of claims that have come out, and so there was recently a, a settlement for $5.5 million that um, this organization called Advocate Health System in Illinois had to pay in, in 2016. It was related to earlier data breaches um, that had compromised 4 million people's records. So you can see that the more, the more people's records were sto storing, not only is the, the bigger kind of risk of the number of people that could be harmed through a breach, but also there becomes more incentive for people who are malicious people who are looking for stuff to say, well, if, if this is a, a, a large and comprehensive uh, and rich database, um, that's going to give me much more incentive to try to get in. We'll be talking more about HIPAA and the specifics of it a bit later on, but so this is just a uh, kind of introduction. In the Europe, I don't in, in the European Union. Sorry, I don't know if people have ever heard of the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a new law. I see a bit of nodding more than with HIPAA. Um, it's going to come into into fully into force this May May twenty fifth. So in a few months, and it's quite different than than HIPAA. Um, so it. It deals with all kind of privacy and personal data in Europe, so it, it's not health specific in any way. Uh, it's not specific to public sector, private sector, or health sector, um, but it's it's highly influential. Europe is seen as kind of um, being kind of the driving force behind a lot of privacy and data protection in the world. And so, for example, um, for Canadians here, I'm not sure if you would have heard of, but one of our um, one of the probably the most famous privacy law in Canada is called PEPIDA. It's a federal private sector law. If you've heard of a, a, a privacy law, it might be that one. And that one was adopted actually in the late 90s. Basically, and people don't like to admit it, I think, uh, but it was basically in response to the precursor to the, the European regulation to say, oh, this new thing is coming into force in Europe. They're only going to allow uh, international transfers of data uh, by, with countries that have uh, significant and strong data protection. So we're going to enact this. Um, so this new regulation that's coming into force is going to up the potential penalties a lot too. Um, and again, this is not health specific, but um, so that the fines that they're going to have are up to $20 million or 4% of a company's annual worldwide wide turnover, which is ever is greater, which is, um, which is a steep penalty. It's seen as being kind of larger than anything we've seen before. Uh, and there are cases in which uh, EU data protection laws carry penalties of imprisonment. There was one case where, I forget which, it was... One of the big tech companies, it wasn't Google, I don't, I can, I, I don't want to get the wrong com uh, company, but some Italian uh, officers were, they didn't end up serving, there ended up being either an appeal or something, but they, there was at one point a verdict saying these people um, were, should be penalized by imprisonment for a data protection violation. I don't think it was, I should look up, I don't think it was Facebook either. There's been, we'll talk about it a bit more, but there's been some litigation around this uh, Facebook and this in Europe as well. Um, so just to, this is a kind of another headline that's saying that the subtext is insiders are mostly to blame. Just, just to say this isn't, what we're talking about when we talk about breaches isn't only necessarily, uh, you know, a hacker sitting in some shadowy area. Sometimes breaches do also, when we're, when we're counting the full number, they do include things like, either an employee uh, accidentally or maliciously um, does something wrong with data. You see it sometimes even things in say, uh, a I, feel like, I feel like coming out of California often in hospitals, it'll be like someone will really want to look at some famous person's health record, so we'll go look it up and they get in trouble. Um, so it's partly things like this that are not necessarily very high tech, but at the same time, 
If you're designing a, a data protection or privacy system well, you shouldn't probably grant access to everyone in your health system, access to anyone's records. So there are ways to think of designing these things to kind of minimize the impact um, of, of whatever harms can take place. Coming specifically to um, cloud stuff, there's kind of, every, this, this is uh, not that recent anymore, I think it's a year or two ago, but um, there are new attacks kind of, kind of coming out every day. This one was pretty a pretty wild one that came out and it's very specific to the kind of things we're talking about. Um, this was an attack that was called, uh, they were referring to it as a row hammer attack. Um, and they're, they're, it's so unforeseeable the way these things work. This was an attack that basically, uh, if you were, so if you were running on one of these shared cloud environments, um, and it turned out if you were to flip the bits on and off in memory really quickly between ones and zeros, you could have an effect over on some other client's uh, memory. And there, was, there were attacks, there were ways to kind of get into um, their stuff. I, people were very surprised when it came out. But so it's kind of just to show that as things are developing so quickly, I think it's good to remember the general principles to, to do your best to keep things secure and to prospectively update. But uh, it's hard to foresee everything that's happening and to remember this. So back to kind of this slide that was initially about email, what, what you see kind of that I was talking about before is the ease, the power, and the convenience. But there's also stuff happening that's not necessarily seen if you're just seeing the convenience. So when you have emails, for example, in the cloud, um, those aren't just sitting there. They're actually being looked at and, and analyzed, not necessarily just by you. Uh, the comp we talk about often um, if, if you're receiving a product for free, it might actually mean that you're that you're not receiving it for free. It might mean that you are the product and you're actually being sold, in this case, to advertisers. So uh, your emails are being combed through to target target you with, with uh, advertising, which some people may be comfortable with, other people's might not be. Of course, there's other stuff going on here too. You're, uh, as we learned in 2013, there are state agencies who are quite interested in all the stuff that's happening in the cloud. Uh, and not only this group of these group of state agencies, but there also is this consortium of it's called Five Eyes that includes Canadian um, kind of uh, intelligence authorities as well as those in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. What's going on also is uh, this sharing is happening across borders, which adds difficulties. So, say something happens with your data you're not comfortable with, um, and say you are it, say you're in Canada and it happens in the United States. How do you can you take legal action? Do you have any legal right to do so? Uh, against whom and how is it is it practical? So this is kind of just to show some of the things. I mean, there's, there's additional issues that I've raised here too. Like there's uh, often subcontracting happening. If there's a company that can't, a cloud company that can't do everything it needs to do on its own, it might pay someone else to. If those people uh, mess something up, how are they responsible? Uh, again, we talked about hackers coming in. So there's a lot more happening here, kind of in in the cloud than you might first see. It's not these aren't exactly the same model that we're seeing exactly, and it's kind of what we're trying to get away from. I think with uh, uh, resources like the collaboratory. But I think it's important to keep, uh, keep this whole backdrop in mind. So as well as the, the kind of ease, uh, ease the uh, low cost and the power, some of the fears people have are opaqueness, uh, dependence, and loss of control in general. And so, so when you have, a, for example, when you're using your own laptop, generally there's, I mean, there's some now increasingly laws that are saying you can't do certain things with your own laptop, but in general you can do what you like with it. Whereas if something's out there in the cloud, um, it's, there's, there's fears that suddenly it's out of your hands. Uh, sometimes those are warranted, sometimes those are not. Um, it can also be difficult uh, if you want to leave the provider you're on if they're not providing uh, sufficient portability to take what you're doing elsewhere. Um, and you don't necessarily know what's happening behind the scenes. So this is just a citation to uh, an article on this more by someone in, uh, at McGill, a professor. So I talked about this a bit already, but one of the one of the fears is that we're basically usually made subject to standard form contracts. Uh, unless you're a really big institution or consortium, if you're if you're buying cloud services from Amazon, you're not going to individually negotiate your terms of service. They're going to kind of impose it on you. And some of those are some of the you know they offer certain privacy protections, but um, there's also some standard terms that are not advantageous to the consumer, such as often. Uh, the cloud service provider, it's fairly standard that they'll say we are allowed to change the terms of this agreement without your consent. Uh, sometimes they'll notify you of the changes that are happening, um, but it's good to be aware of these, these kinds of things. Stability uh, depends, can be a concern. There have been some kind of mid-sized cloud providers that have kind of quickly shut their doors over, overnight, leaving people in a bit of a lurch to say, well, I have all this data in there. I don't actually have the capacity to store it myself. That's why I put it in the cloud. And how am I supposed to get it out of there in time if you're closing next month? Um, 
not as probably not as much of a concern if you're going with one of the big cloud providers. Um, but again, it, it, similar problems can come up if suddenly the terms of service change and you don't want to be there anymore. Um, so something to be uh, well aware of. Similarly, the, the contracts will set out who, who is liable in case of a data breach or something goes wrong. Um, and it's good to be aware of who, who will be responsible for what, uh, who will take responsibility for what. I mentioned before um, third-party surveillance. A lot of times the laws, there's not a lot of exceptions to them. It's not as though you can kind of make a contract saying there will be no third-party surveillance of this, of this information. But there are some mechanisms that can at least try to minimize that. So, for example, there's actually a big case before the U.S. Supreme Court now between Microsoft um, and uh, the U.S. government. I think it's the FBI. The, the dispute is Microsoft has a subsidiary in Ireland that's holding a certain amount of data. And there's a subpoena saying that Microsoft in the U.S. should be able to retrieve that data from Ireland um, and give it to the state. They're saying, no, 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 you can't control things that are outside of the jurisdictional territory of the U.S. There's been a huge amount of uh, yeah, court litigation and fighting over it. So uh, this, that was, I just brought that up to kind of mention you can try to either contract or work with organizations that are going to more explicitly state that they will try to take whatever legal measures are necessary to, to, um, to protect uh, information from kind of widespread um, surveillance rather than ones that are just going to hand it over right away. Although. Often this is happening in secret, so it's difficult to tell. Getting back to kind of more the specific um, context, that, that was kind of more general data protection stuff, but now coming back to more the health, genomic, et cetera context, one of the things that's difficult with this is there's, we'll talk about some exceptions, but um, there's most of the privacy data protection stuff is not uh, genomic or even health necessarily specific at all. I talked about HIPAA before being an exception, but so it's not always clear how the laws are going to apply to these different contexts. And there's actually a pretty big amount of debate about whether they should be. Um, some people fiercely say no, genomic data is not actually that different than any other health data or maybe data at all. It should just be governed by the same rules. Other, other people say no, there's something specific about this that, that kind of merits a certain type of protection. Um, so to talk about some of the things that could be specific in, in the cases of genomics, one thing that comes up a lot is, is the possibility of discrimination. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, this idea. So there was a law that was passed in the US called GINA, the Genetic uh, Information Non-Discrimination, um, I feel like ACT. Uh, and the idea is that there's people who are interested in people's genomic data to make certain decisions about their lives. There's, it could be any number of different actors, but the ones we usually end up talking about are insurers and employers. And so there was a case, I think just before Gina came into force in the US where, for example, there was a, I'm pretty sure it was an NFL player who was, didn't have their contract renewed because the team had access to his uh, genetic profile, decided he was at risk for serious diseases very soon and did not want to, um, did not want to extend the contract. And so um, Canada very recently actually was one of the last uh, kind of developed nations to, to adopt a Genetic Non-Discrimination Act a year or two ago, and, but it's of limited scope. It only applies to certain uh, federal public sector stuff. Um, and so the idea is usually these, what these laws are saying are things like uh, insurers can't uh, force you to have uh, a genetic test against your will. They can't, uh, if they somehow get your uh, data through other means, they can't use it against you. Um, similarly with employers. But there's a certain amount of controversy about this too. And it's, it's interesting because it becomes really a question of values in some ways. Because a lot of people are saying, well, this is kind of ridiculous. All that insurers do is collect health data in order to develop risk profiles, in order to figure out how much some, a person might cost or might not cost. So how is genetic uh, information any different than any other type of information. Um, and of course, there's an opposing view that says, no, this is, this is going in a really bad direction. If we're starting to allow people just to not be hired at jobs, not, not have access to adequate health care because of their genetic profile. So um, generally, the trend is, is toward this. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is it's one of the things that can impact, um, say, even your, say, an informed consent uh, statement in, in a research project. Because normally uh, the idea in an informed consent is you have to make people aware of all the risks they might be subject to. So it's possible that you might have to make them aware of, of uh, the possibility of discrimination if their uh, genetic data is leaked, uh, which might be mitigated by the fact that there, if there's a, a framework like this in place. So that was the first thing. 
Uh, and then in general, there's just the idea that uh, sensitive health information is generally thought to be sensitive, especially medical information. So um, directly, sometimes your the information in these databases will talk about a person's either have a, either their susceptibility to disease, things inferences you can make based on their DNA. Um, but then there are also kind of indirect things you can say. So if, if someone, if you have someone's DNA and you can you can find out that they participated in a study and you know that that study was only studying people with a certain disease, you can kind of infer that the person had that disease, which is something that's uh, happened in some of the attacks that I think I'll talk about a bit later on. Um, paternity information is one that comes up sometimes. I'm not sure how how much this has resulted from like breaches and things, but it has been something that comes up often in genetic ethics. If people are getting genetic tests and discover that, you know, their one of their parents is not, I mean, their biological parents is not who they thought their biological parents were, that can have considerable impacts on them. Um, there's possibilities of identity theft. I'm not sure how practical these are yet, but there's increasing, people are increasingly turning to using uh, biometric identifiers. So biometrics obviously become sensitive in a different way that way. Um, uh, yeah, as well as some other legal issues. Another thing I want to get to too is, um, Along with kind of these uh, these vulnerabilities that we talked about so far, there are other some of the things that are specific to DNA, in that things are moving so fast that we're not we're not actually necessarily sure what kinds of things might come up in the future. Um, and there's an argument that they're kind of exacerbated by the fact that uh, DNA is static or immutable in a way that some other data is not. So, for example, suppose there was a breach. I mean, there was a people might have heard of the big breach at Equifax. Um, uh, it was a, a big credit reporting agency that had a, a really terrible data breach. People's data was leaked. Uh, or if your credit card company was breached and your credit card information was leaked, that could be a big problem. Uh, you could you could have some issues around identity theft, et cetera, coming up. The difference that there might be there and here is if my financial information is breached, my credit card's breached, I can close my credit card, uh, get a new number, uh, you know, kind of hopefully move on even if I lost some money. It's trickier with your genetic information. You can't if if your if your DNA is breached and it's out there, you can't close the account, change your change your base pairs. Um, you're kind of stuck with it, right? So it's it's one of the. I mean, there's a whole bunch of I guess uh, cliched metaphors about Pandora's boxes and unringing bells that you could use, but that's that's the basic idea here. So. Uh, Another kind of set of harms is, of course, those to researchers, which are often going to be reputational. If your project is one of the ones um, that is breached, um, it can create problems for the field as a whole. Uh, it can also cause problems to, to uh, getting future funding. There are the, the possibilities of fines. Those are the, the, in practice, in research, I think the consequences tend to be more reputational and career oriented. There's, I don't, I haven't heard of a case where a researcher has been, you know. Either either gotten a huge fine or sent to jail for data protection breaches, but it's something that's that's possible under uh, laws that are coming into effect. Uh, oh, here I've got actually a, a citation to that Google. It was Google Italy, I, so I was wrong in saying I thought it wasn't. But this was the the jail sentence uh, case was uh, in this case in Google Italy versus uh, uh, I think that's the Italian Data Protection Office. So, um, like I mentioned before, also some of the novel risks that we have complicate giving informed consent to participants. So if you want to make someone aware, say, um, you know, even something like using data in the cloud, uh, if your data is being stored in the cloud by Amazon, say you're in Europe or somewhere else, there's the possibility that um, intelligence agencies are going to suck it up in one of their their uh, big drives, but we're not actually sure what the consequences of that would be. How, should you communicate that in an informed consent form? If so, how? Um, as well as kind of all these novel genetic issues that we, I've been talking about. Um, there's also the risk that as the regulation gets overly cumbersome, that uh, medical research can be stalled. Uh, especially if it's kind of disproportionate and not actually geared towards the possible effects. So kind of shifting gears and moving almost in the opposite direction, I want to talk now, I think it was touched on almost a bit in the previous one about a different set of rules that are kind of coming up that are almost pushing in the opposite direction. So, so since the start, um, open data has been a huge part of, uh, of genomics. 
kind of in my previous uh, computer science days, I was a, a big part of, uh, I mean, I was at least very interested, I don't know that I was played a big role, but interested in uh, free open source software projects, contributing to those, using those, and so those kind of values have been uh, encapsulated in genomics since the start. So um, pretty much right away it was recognized that because Initially, at least, the cost of um, sequencing even one genome was so great, uh, uh, and now even as the cost is coming down, we're sequencing so many more genomes, there's still a lot of money going into it, that uh, there was an idea that this, re this, this, this kind of resource shouldn't be uh, hoarded, is the way some people are putting it. It should be shared, it should be used to, the, to maximum effect uh, for potential change. Uh, and there's also the, the kind of, the fact that a lot of the R&D money that went into this was public money, that was, the state was funding it, so that's kind of an added reason why uh, this data shouldn't be you know, misused or not used properly. And this kind of over time, and it actually very quickly became part of uh, the kind of policy principles that were, have guided the field ever since. So we saw kind of in 1996, the Bermuda principles were a pretty landmark example that uh, already says that kind of Researchers should be releasing any sequence assemblies that they come across that are larger than a kilobyte, preferably within 24 hours, so rapid release is really a key principle. Um, they also ask researchers to waive their intellectual property rights so that uh, sequences are freely available and people can get maximum benefit out of them. Uh, and then uh, the idea was also that uh, finished annotated sequences should be published immediately. Uh, and so. What they were kind of pushing back against at that point, I think, was mostly fears of kind of scholarly competition. Uh, the idea is, you know, I've done all this work to produce this result. I don't want someone scooping me. I don't want someone to publish my findings before I have the chance to. When I'm the one who's spent all the, gotten the grant, paid the money. Um, so one of the one of the ways that it's kind of uh, people. I'm mean, sure people are probably aware of this if you're all in health fields. But one of the things that people that have been drawn on is uh, the idea of publication embargoes, so that even if the data is shared, no one else is allowed to publish on it until the, it, the kind of primary researcher has had the first chance to do so. Those seem to be, the embargoes seem to be falling a bit out of favor recently. Uh, I think they weren't in the most recent uh, genomic data sharing policy that I mentioned here from the NIH. I think they're much less heavily um, focused on, but uh, those are, that was the, at the time that was kind of the competing, one of the main competing factors with the the push towards open data and open sharing. Michael, yeah. The, the other thing about the Bermuda Agreement is also at the same time at the early phase of the New Genome Project, NATO was starting to come out, and it was also Celera, the company, was also starting that competition between the private sector and mm. the, the public sector was, was sort of at its nascent uh, stages as well. Mm. And they wanted to knit that to the private thing. Okay. That makes sense, thanks. So then I also, I reference here a similar, um, more recent, this is a Canadian, um, and so tri agents here is referring to the, the three big Canadian funders uh, in the national, uh, medical sciences, natural sciences, and social sciences that have their own uh, open access policy. Sometimes, sometimes related, this is more focused on publications, but there are also kind of data sharing policies that exist uh, in Canada as well. So the overarching principles that we're seeing kind of um, being embodied here, I mentioned kind of rapid release of data. Uh, it's often, I think as was mentioned in the previous presentation, it's mandatory to deposit them in approved open access repositories so people can have access to them. Uh, the results are supposed to, or increasingly there's a desire to see results published in open access journals. Uh, I mentioned embargoes already. Uh, touched briefly on one of the real issues I'm not touching on too much that I actually probably should touch on more is there's also a bit of a there's a, a bunch of discussion as well over the degree to which intellectual property rights are, are legitimate over um, genomic sequences. People may have heard of the U.S. Supreme Court case of Myriad where the Supreme Court found that at least naturally occurring genetic sequences weren't, weren't subject to patents. Um, and so that's part of there's been a push push for that as well. Um, and again, the kind of potential sanctions are largely the, the risk that you might lose funding or, or reputation, which is, which is already pretty significant. I'm not, I mean, we'll get to this a bit later, but I'm not sure that, you know, a hefty jail sentence is needed. Uh, although in certain contexts, there's people pushing in this direction, which 
Uh, I think it's wrong-headed. But, but despite kind of all this, there still seems to be, this is uh, coming out recently, a publication kind of reminding people to deposit their DNA sequences because it's not, still not happening across the board for, you know, what, for whatever reason, whether people are, are worried about the competition or whether they uh, just have not gotten around to publishing their sequences, they find it too cumbersome, etc. But I think it's important to kind of contrast these two things because it puts researchers and people maybe in, in your, ch your chairs in an awkward position a bit where you have these really competing um, policy and legal uh, obligations where the open data push is really telling you share everything as much as you can and some of the privacy restrictions are saying well you should protect things to a certain degree so it's almost like um, it's, I feel like it's uh, coming to a stage where you kind of have to share everything except for what you're prohibited from sharing. So um, it comes a bit comes a bit trickier. There's less discretion uh, available. Can I, can I share my, my my point of view on that? Is that Please do. DNA sequences? There is so much to discover that the scientists who sequence the DNA will not even have time to go look for. It. And so I think, and there's obviously knowledge and, and discoveries to be made in aggregating large data sets and, and having access to very, very large data sets. So that, um, and then in the ICGC uh, consortium, so the International Cancer Genomics Consortium, there was no IP on the DNA sequence itself. Of course, people and companies and whoever can have IP downstream with drugs and so forth. So it's not against people making money, but it's against people making money on the knowledge of the data, which should be shared by all, so all can make discoveries, and so we can get more eyeballs on the data. I mean, it's sort of the, uh, the important thing is, there's so much data, there's so much we don't know yet, and we need more people to access, to look at it, to, to make discoveries. Yeah, and that's my... prevent that from happening, we're doing, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm. That's my understanding of kind of the compromise that ICGC, can correct me if I'm wrong, but the compromise that I understand ICGC has tried to come to around intellectual property in its, in its policies are that in general the information that it's storing and is producing shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, if you're a company or someone accessing it, you shouldn't be trying to patent data or, or to place intellectual property yeah, on data that's going in. That, that, but if you, because of sequence information, you're able to find a target for which you can make a drug. So you can make all the IP on that as you like, yeah. but not on, the, on, not on the protein or DNA sequences. Yeah, and my understanding is the underlying principle is really to try to get at this idea that, um, I think it, the, the idea is kind of like avoid intellectual property when possible to ha enable the most sharing, but there are certain times it's been argued that uh, certain products just won't get to market unless the company has a, enough interest in having a certain amount of intellectual property in the final leg of it. And so that, that the door has been in the policy left open for that. Um, so now moving into the third part of the four-part presentation. This just raises kind of some of the, the privacy and data protection issues that come up. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is kind of the cross-border issue. I'm talking about the way it's playing out in Europe because I think that's kind of a specific context. I mentioned before, I didn't mention the, this is the precursor to that um, uh, data protection regulation that's coming out soon. The precursor came out in 1995, it was called the Data Protection Regula uh, Directive. The new uh, kind of successor, I mean it was it was published in the law books in 2016, but it's only coming into, into force this May. Uh, and they're similar, although there's some diff legal differences. For example, a regulation is directly enforceable throughout the entire European Union, whereas a directive, each country had to adopt a version of the of the directive into its own law. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a similar but amped up version of it. And so immediately the, the idea came up, uh, and it isn't only to prevent, you know, certain uses of data. Part of the kind of subtitle of this law is, and to promote almost the sharing and harmonization of, of, of data. And the idea was if we have harmonized uh, privacy and data protection rules around the union, then we can allow data to flow, flow pretty free, freely through the European Union and be assured that it'll be provided the same protection. The immediate question is then, well, what if the data goes outside of the European Union? So what if you have an ICGC member that wants to send data outside? How does that work? And there's a, there's a, a mechanism that was uh, adopted in the law that says that the European Commission can look at another uh, country's legal instrument and decide that that provides adequate uh, protection uh, and you can be approved that way. So I mentioned before Canada's PEPIDA, 
was adopted pretty soon after applied. It got approved to be deemed adequate. Um, in the U.S., they took uh, this fairly unique self-regulatory -regula approach where it wasn't a law that they adopted, but they, the, the Department of Commerce put together this kind of policy where you could self-certify yourself uh, as a company to say, we're going to follow these principles that have been published, um, and we'll make public claims saying that is this as much, and that means that the FTC can take enforcement action against us, uh, and it tries to meet kind of a similar level of protection, and they were also approved. This is all probably, well, PEPIDA was approved probably around 2000. I think the safe harbor was around 2002. Um, but this all also is, bef this is kind of almost, as you may be aware, 2000 and 2002 are kind of almost, not prehistoric, but are old in, in internet years. Um, so after, this guy, his name is Max Schrems, but this, now we're moving to kind of the post-Edward uh, Snowden era. Obviously things really changed when Edward Snowden revealed that there was widespread surveillance happening. This young uh, law student named Max Schrems decided this was a problem, and he I ended up uh, starting a court challenge. Based on his Facebook data, he said, look, my Facebook data is being shared across the Atlantic. Uh, my Facebook, Facebook's in Europe is headquartered in Ireland. He was Austrian. But so he, he started this case that was Schrems versus the Data Protection Authority of Ireland. When it climbed up all the, court, the courts all the way to the European Court of Justice in 2016, and he was essentially challenging the 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 adequacy of the, the agreement, not the agreement itself, but the fact that it had this kind of green check mark. Uh, the European Court of Justice ended up. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before while this case was ongoing, Quebec, the province in uh, in Canada where I am coming from also has its own uh, private sector public, uh, public, private sector pub, uh, privacy law. Um, they started making moves to try to get adequacy status. Again, this is post-Snowden. Um, post People were surprised that the regulators made science to say that they were not going to pass, and they ended up abandoning their, their attempt. Uh, and what was some people were criticizing it because the Quebec's law was widely seen to be stronger than the federal Pepita law and offer better protections. Uh, and some people have argued this shows that the regulators are just totally incoherent. Uh, my thinking is a bit different, is that things really did change after 2012, 2013 with Snowden, and the, they started looking at things a lot more strictly. So um, after this, this is when the, the case finally came down, and then the safe harbor agreement was uh, struck down as no longer being adequate, which really threw things into confusion because there, this is different than the Quebec case where there are already companies relying on this, right? And then suddenly overnight, okay, this isn't deemed legal anymore, well, what do we do? They ended up um, quickly putting in, in place a successor uh, mechanism called the Privacy Shield, which is not that different from Safe Harbor, uh, and has been subject to court, court challenges of its own. So far it has uh, survived, but it was deemed adequate right away. Uh, but there are ongoing challenges. There's, the European Commission has said this needs to be renegotiated. Uh, they pointed, pointed to a number of weaknesses. So there were things going on, with, especially with Safe Harbor, such as Companies were self-certifying that they were following these principles, but it turned out they actually weren't doing anything about it in their daily practice. That was obviously a problem. Um, but the main things they were focusing on, I think, were the kind of bulk uh, state surveillance stuff, as well, as well as some other issues. So this is kind of... Um, so I, I'm actually putting a question mark, too, beside the Canadian law, Papita, here, because there's currently, under the directive, there was no mechanism to review adequacy. So once uh, a law was deemed adequate, it was kind of adequate forever. Under the new regulation now, they're actually going to be reviewed every, I think, three years. I forget the, the time period. Uh, and there are a number of people saying, well, you know, Quebec's law was uh, seen to be stronger than Papita. Is Papita going to withstand the scrutiny? And actually, a couple weeks ago, there was a bunch of amendments that were proposed uh, to Papita to hopefully bring it more in line. But all this to say that um, when personal data is crossing borders, it's definitely an ethical issue that's being taken seriously now. There's a lot of confusion around it. It's good to know on what legal basis um, you are sharing data uh, across borders. And these adequacy decisions, I'm kind of glossing over it quickly, but they're not the only mechanism that allows. It doesn't mean that if you're in a country that doesn't have a, an adequacy decision, you can't have Europeans' data ever. There are other alternative mechanisms. but. It's just good to be aware of some of the, the controversies that are playing out now. Uh, another separate kind of issue that you may or may not have um, encountered, and this is, I'm, I'm kind of um, honing in on data protection and uh, privacy law here, but it applies also in other contexts like research ethics law, um, uh, 
kind of medical informed consent law. One of the big issues that traditionally was seen as the way to address these issues and to kind of um, get the best of both worlds is to notice that the way that the laws are defined, um, I'm using a very US-based term here, personally identifying information. Whenever you see that kind of term, you know it's like a US person talking. Um, Europeans would call it personal data. In Canada, we tend to call it uh, personal information. Uh, but the idea is that these laws are defined so they only regulate uh, what's called personal information. Uh, other kinds of information that aren't personal, meaning they don't relate to a person, um, are not regulated at all and you can do what you like with them. But if that's not clear, maybe I can, the, the simplest way to think of it is back in the day I think it was, imagine that say you had someone's hospital record with a bunch of information, some of which is interesting to you, some of which is not. You remove their name, you remove their phone number, you remove their patient ID, you remove anything that could identify them, you have what's left. Uh, and that could be seen as not being personal information. That's just uh, information that could be about anything or anyone, but it's still helpful to us because it has some value. So kind of implicitly in these laws, there's something else called non-identifying information, uh, or we sometimes call it anonymized or anonymous information that's not regulated. So the idea was that this was the way that um, you could have both satisfy this open data, this push for open data, but also have perfect privacy because no one's, no one's uh, at risk, but also we can still use the data. So the first question to ask though is how do we decide what is personally identifying information, what is not? In the law, there are kind of two different approaches. There's a contextual approach, which basically is like an ad hoc case by case thing where you just on any case, look, look at the data, say, well, this person, you know, has uh, Part of their zip code was included, but only the first number or first two numbers. You probably could never figure out who that would be. It could refer to thousands of people. Um, and the way the, the legal terminology they usually use is uh, whether it's reasonably foreseeable that alone or in combination with other data, it could be used to re-identify the in individual. Less common, um, you'll see like a rules-based approach. Uh, and we'll look at specifically the, that law HIPAA that I talked about before because it's pretty exceptional in that it's only the, it actually has a almost algorithmic process that you can go through to say follow these steps. If you do so, our law will consider that your data has been de-identified, you're not subject to any more of our regulations anymore. And they actually have a list of uh, 18 fields that you need to remove to satisfy this. Uh, it's seen, although you can see the advantages and drawbacks, I think, to both. It, obviously, if you're trying to comply with the law, it's way nicer to have it just a set defined algorithm go through these steps and you're, you're done. You know, you know you're, you're positive that you're complying with the law, whereas the contextual approach, who knows what is and what is not. The downside is that the, the fields that you need to remove don't necessarily correspond to what actually will anonymize something. It's, it's very possible to have fields removed that you wouldn't need to remove and they would still be anonymized even if you kept them in that you might want to be using for things. And it's also quite possible to remove all those 18 fields and still have a set of data that's highly identifiable. Um, and so my last point kind of here, I say it's an even less appealing approach in the big data era. Um, but just to look at it, what the HIPAA privacy rules, uh, is what's, it's called the safe harbor, but it's a different safe harbor than that international data sharing agreement I was talking about before. They're totally separate things, but for some reason they're called the same thing. Um, so they say you got to remove names. Um, any geographic divisions smaller than a state, except for there's a, you can have part of a zip code. Any dates, any telephone numbers, any fax numbers, as you can tell it's not a brand new um, law. Electronic, e e so email addresses. Uh, a whole bunch of different different things, and then but then they have at the end. I don't know if I included here. They have an additional one. I don't see it here. That's any other identifying uh, code or uh, sequence number or etc. So that one, and then also you can see P here, biometric identifiers, including finger and voice prints. The, the, one of the questions here is well, the next question I have is what about DNA? You don't you didn't see DNA listed anywhere. If you have you know either say one, one single, uh, single nucleotide variant, is that anonymized or not? If you have a whole genome sequence, is, can that be considered anonymized or not? Um, and interestingly, we don't have really an answer for that. I've known some people who've tried to specifically ask the US regulators, you know, is DNA covered by some of these more vague terms that we've got here? And they kind of have so far refused to answer. So um, we don't necessarily know. Um, 
it. Yeah, I will. Uh, no, no problem. I will get to it soon. So there are some people who, until recently, and I probably shouldn't pick on, I mean, science, science moves. Um, the, this thinking that anonymization could reconcile all the problems that, that we're having went far enough that there were people arguing fairly recently that DNA, even seemingly even whole genome sequences, could be seen as uh, as de-identified. There's you know there's just these strings of letters. How are you going to link it back to someone's name? What, what how would that be possible? So there's a, a paper even as recently as 2007 that said if you're storing DNA without identity data, and if there's no clue from whom the sample originates. Such a sample is de facto anonymous. Um, an anonymous DNA, they're defining here as sample stored without data or a code. Um, which, just to be clear, this is, I think this is no longer, I don't think it was probably even true then, but I think it's not true now. Um, and I'll get to that more in detail later, but for some reason, first I put in a slide. Well, I think this ties in, but this is kind of, kind of further the idea that there's a tension between open data and privacy. Um, because if you look really at the, the definition of open data, the way it's defined, they use phrases like that the data must be provided as a whole, uh, it must be free to use, there can't be legal restrictions on its use, it has to be usable for any purpose, and it has to be freely redistributable. And these are pretty much the mirror opposite images if you look at all the techniques we have for privacy protection. So things we do when we're trying to protect data is either we don't provide the whole thing, you know, by anonymizing it, uh, either we make restrictions on it so you can't share it with certain people so it's not free to use, or we say you can only use it for specific purposes and you can't redistribute it. So, it's, so I, I think there's, we're still looking for ways to reconcile these two things, but there's, there's a really core tension there. Um, so now I'll get to kind of the, the, the kind of sad fall from grace that, that we've seen mostly for anonymization over the last few, um, few years to decades. Uh, but pretty early on, so there were some famous examples even where, for example, Netflix at one point decided that it wanted a better algorithm. You know when it, it suggests to you what movie you might want to watch next? Um, they wanted a be better algorithm for that, so they decided they were going to release um, anonymized viewing histories of all, of, I don't know if it was all, but a large number of Netflix users uh, to take off the person's name and their account number. People can feel free to play around with this data. And pretty quickly, uh, there were some researchers that said, oh, we're able to re-identify a whole bunch of people just based on their movie watching habits, which seems maybe surprising. And you could see this as kind of a hack, and not, not a hack, but in a, like in a derogatory sense, not a real trick. But what they did was they said, well, there's some people who are going to have, have a tendency to watch a Netflix movie, and then right away on, say, IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes, review it. And if we just compare the timestamps of when they watched the movie, when they rated the movie, and if we see matches all down, we can figure out who's who. So you, you would have to say, okay, this person would have to be one of those people that's rating movies. Uh, but increasingly, we've seen more and more clever ways that you would never have initially thought of um, to, to re-identify data. There's one famous example here that's quite old where there was de-identified medical data on this kind of uh, almost Venn diagram you see where they removed almost everything. Well, they removed names, et cetera, but they just left zip, the zip code, birth date, and, and sex. And it turns out in the U.S., I think it's about like 89% of people are uniquely identified by their zip code, birth date, and sex. Uh, and it turns out those three things are also included in voter lists, which you can go down and get a copy of the voter list. So um, this data that had been anonymized was able to be re-identified. Uh, oh, I mentioned the Netflix one. There was another case with AOL for similar reasons, publishing um, people's search history, so the search requests people were sending out uh, without their name saying this is anonymized, without recognizing you know, that people might have a tendency to search their own name, um, which would be included, of course, in what they sent out. So the consensus that's kind of come up now is that, I, this might be too strong to be true, but it's close to the idea that data can't be fully anonymized and still remain useful. Um, this is a slide again, this is kind of Bridging the two things, I'm bringing it up here again to talk about how unique uh, DNA is, which which bears on uh, anonymity. But this is also kind of ties into what I was talking about before about this debate of whether genomics should be specifically regulated. This was a paper that came out, I think, a couple of years ago, where this set of researchers were saying, "Okay, yeah, there's nothing totally specific to DNA, but here's a set of six features that are, you know, some of them are also shared by other biometrics, but some of them are, if you take this constellation." Um, we can see some specificity. As far as re-identification of genomic data, um, I've got, I'm listing a whole bunch of papers here. I guess I didn't list the actual publications, but hopefully they're still findable. And over the last, say, 10, 15 years, we're seeing an increasing 
uh, ability to re-identify data or re-identify genomic data. Two, two studies that I think are of particular importance. One was the, the Homer paper that Francis mentioned. And these were all kind of seen as surprising ways to re-identify things at the time. So um, Homer's was specifically using US's uh, dbGaP database, the database of genotypes and phenotypes. And if I remember correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought, oh yeah, sorry, this is the results that had an impact on dbGaP. Yeah, yeah, it was a GWAS study. So they ended up with, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but they ended up with, um, the, the output that they had was aggregate data. So it wasn't any one person's data. It was an aggregate result, but I guess it was so uh, such a, an amount of granularity that uh, this guy, Homer, and his fellow researchers discovered that if you had pre-existing um, someone's DNA, you could figure out whether they were in the study or they had not been in the study just based on the aggregate. Uh, and previously, there was a strong tendency to think that aggregated data is anonymized data. It doesn't relate to one person. It relates to, you know, hundreds or thousands of people. And in this case, if, sorry? In the Homer paper is about schizophrenia. So they, yeah. they're able to, to see if people belong to the control group or to the affected group of schizophrenia. So they could take anybody and bin them into those two categories. Exactly. So you can figure out with their diagnosis whether they have this disease, which is... Uh, so obviously this, this paper in particular, you're laughing, it sent shockwaves kind of through the field and it ended up previously, but this is why sorry, I was thinking of dbGaP is because... There was no, it was not in dbGaP, it went into dbGaP. Yeah, but previously also dbGaP had been, uh, as I understand it, fully open access. Yeah. And it was right after the Homer paper came out, they said, no, no, we have, to, we have to close this down and only allow kind of certified researchers to have access now because we're realizing there's actually sensitive data that's coming out here. Um, one other notable one I'll draw attention to also, they're, they're, these papers kind of follow an interesting trend, but uh, the GIMREC paper from 2013 was one of the first ones where they were actually able to go back from, um, they had just DNA, and they were actually able to go back to re-identify people and figure out who their names were. They used, if I remember correctly, they used a kind of a, an interesting and complicated way of going through Ancestry.com, but also through figuring out patrilineal bloodlines and that the the family name would be shared. Uh, I can't remember exactly how it worked, but it, it similarly, people had been saying, or some people had still been insisting that there was no way to, from a pure genetic sequence to go back to someone's name. And at least in some cases now, we know that's not the case. I think that's the one with the protein, right? So the yeah. data, basically cell lines, they're fully public, the sequence is, there's no control access, it's all open, and they were able to identify the, from whom the, the cell lines yeah, and so in, in recent papers we're seeing things even, and I think it, since this Kai paper in 2015 they've even maybe gotten more granular, but you're seeing things like being able to, I'm not sure now if re-identify is the right word here, it might just be uniquely identify, but in any case identify or uniquely identify uh, an individual based purely on 25 randomly selected uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms from welcome trust data, which is uh, much different than people kind of saying, or very recently before, you know, an unlimited amount of DNA is not, shouldn't be considered identifiable. Uh, one of the other difficulties in this area of anonymization is that there's really poorly standardized terminology, um, especially in the regulatory context that makes it unclear what people are talking about. Um, this is uh, kind of a paper that I co-authored on this topic and, and others. So anytime you are, like, my, the point here is kind of to try, kind of try to be skeptical of anonymization. It's not, it, it's not I shouldn't overly pan it. There, it's always useful to reduce identifiability of data when you don't need that extra data to, to minimize kind of the risk. Um, but it's not kind of the panacea we thought before. And when you are using it, it's helpful, especially according to guidelines and policies, it's really helpful to always define the term you're using because a lot of the key terms are used by different people in really different ways. Uh, and really contradictory and confusing ways. So it's, it's always good to make sure, but generally what we, when we say anonymization, um, what we mean is that something has been irreversibly, well, at least we think, we can't foresee that it would be, ever be re-identified. It's seen to have been re irreversibly re-identified. So, I mean, at the extreme, I think you can, you can think of some genetic data that you, you could, or genetic information could be this if you say, you know, X percent of the population has this variant. That's still genetic inf data, but it's hard to imagine, you know, unless you're talking about a very, very rare disease of one person or something, how it would relate to any one person. Um, De-identification can be used 
it's sometimes used in a way that's a synonym for anonymization, but sometimes it means much broader things. And so, for example, the EU law uses a word called pseudonymization, which basically means you add in some mechanism to allow the possibility to re-identify someone, like a code that you're going to store elsewhere with their name. So if you ever do need to go back to it, you can, but you can still distribute the data uh, with a kind of reasonable assurances. Sometimes the identification is seen to, to um, include that, sometimes not. But the idea is just if you ever are making recourse to these uh, concepts, be very clear about which one you're using. Um, so continuing kind of with the criticisms of anonymization, the identification as techniques, there are some also coming from, from opposite directions or different directions saying that, you know, there, some people are arguing that there are cases in which we have to return results to a patient. Say we find a, um, a clini clinically significant vari variant that we weren't looking for, we didn't know was there, and it's highly dangerous and it's actionable, we should be able to re-identify that person and find who they are and alert them of it. Um, Similarly, this, there's under privacy law, so this, I guess this isn't not related to privacy law, but there are usually duties to allow someone to withdraw. If we don't know who they are, they might have a hard time withdrawing. Um, and there are also people saying that anonymization sterilizes the data so much that you lose so much if you're trying to properly identify, you have to take so much out, uh, and it might even uh, encumber you if you want to do um, longitudinal studies and follow someone over time. How are you supposed to do that if you don't know who they are? So other people are saying we shouldn't be kind of doing it for this reason. Um, so basically, there was such so much focus on anonymization before that since it's kind of, the conference has kind of crumbled, there's been a bit of a scramble to search for um, alternatives to, to take its place. What kind of mechanisms are we gonna, are we going to use? And people, some people are saying we should use more technical solutions, find new technical ways of doing this. Others are looking for legal solutions. Others organizational, etc. Um, this is a map, um, I found it kind of interesting, it was from that same paper as the kind of flower genomic exceptionalism um, diagram before. This is one set of researchers arguing for the parts of the genomic research process that they think some of them there are technical solutions to privacy possible, others they're not and you have to rely on the law. Uh, I'm not sure I agreed with the way they categorized everything, but I think it's an interesting approach. Uh, oh, I notice, I might... Am I going till 12? What, when is this? 12.30? Okay, I may have to rush through some of the stuff then that I've got. Um, I may rush through this in particular. There was an interesting, I'll, I'll talk about it in a couple sentences, but there was an interesting kind of, one of the, the next steps that people are looking at, um, one that I, I'm, I think I'm an outlier, but I strongly disagree with it, um, is some, there's a certain uh, set of, especially law and policy makers that are saying, okay, anonymization has failed, uh, the technical solution doesn't work for us anymore. We should turn to a legal solution instead. And what we'll do is we'll say that um, even we'll, we'll try to technically identify the data as well as we can, still release it to the public, and then we'll just make a really severe criminal punishment if you try to re-identify the data. And then it'll be kind of just the same as though we had made it technically identifiable, which uh, I think I, I'm really opposed to this idea. I'm surprised at seeing as much uh, success as it is. And so this example is one example, uh, not to pick on Australia, they're doing a similar thing in, in the UK, but there was an example where um, me public Medicare data was published. They actually did a pretty good job for researchers online. Um, yeah, and I'll zoom through this pretty quickly. Uh, people can look into the articles about this, they're pretty easy to find if you want. Um, I, and they included their methodology for de-identifying, which I think is, is good to do from an open standpoint. Uh, they you, you relied on encryption. Um, what ended up happening was that there were academics who were able to re-identify the data. And essentially, um, the government's response was to say, we're going to adopt a criminal penalty if anyone tries to re-identify this data. It's too late now. It's already out there. It still hasn't come into force, but, um, but it would make it a crime to intentionally re-identify data published by the government. Uh, and we're seeing this in other, like I mentioned, in other, in other countries like the UK. I think I probably don't have time to talk about it. If, if anyone's interested to talk to me about it more, it's a, an area of interest of mine. I'd be happy to. Um, so some of the other more technical novel approaches that people are looking at are some cryptographic ones. Homomorphic encryption has been really interesting, especially in the cloud context. It's a technology that would actually allow you to not only upload encrypted genomic data or other data to the cloud, but also to upload encrypted operations that the 
cloud service provider can't read but can perform the analysis in the cloud and then return an encrypted result. So it's kind of the ideal technology in the case where you have a cloud provider operating across borders that you don't trust and you want to hide the information from them, but you still want to be able to use the resources. Unfortunately, it hasn't really, although there's been proof of concepts and small um, small kind of operations carried out with it, it hasn't scaled to a, a large size yet, although there's uh, active development in the area. Differential privacy, um, people may have heard of it's. It's, I don't want to say it's similar, but it, it's, a, it's also a technical, or a technical solution rather than a legal one. I was going to talk a bit more about um, some responses to surveillance. One maybe I'll, I'll highlight is um, people in the US, the NIH has an interesting mechanism called the Cert Certificates of Confidentiality that actually allow you to say, they, they come out of actually research in the 70s when there were drug users. Say uh, people wanted to do, uh, researchers wanted to study injection drug users but uh, the injection drug users are kind of like, oh, I'm not going to participate in your study if you're going to give my data over to the police about my drug use. So they adopted this new mechanism that allowed um, studies to be kind of, have a certain level of immunity from, from uh, surveillance and uh, state disclosure. And it's been kind of uh, amped up over time. So it's worth looking into if, if this is something of interest to you and in providing additional confidentiality to users of your research. But the kind of uh, largest, what's, mostly been used in, in practice is moving from open access, like we mentioned, to controlled access. So the idea with ICGC is there's, there still is some open access data. There's one data set that's open to everyone. There's another set, set of data that you only can have access to if you have approval of a data access compliance office. And it's generally, the division is generally, if we think something's either anonymous, we can make it open, or, if we th or maybe if we think it's quite anonymous, but is, not, is also not very sensitive, uh, there's a calculus that's done around that. So in, uh, for, for the ICGC project in particular, uh, through their online uh, web data portal, I think you'll be seeing this more. This will be probably what we'll be talking about a lot this week. But you can actually look through all the data they have. It's all indexed there. Uh, you can build up a manifest of what you want. If what you want is in the control tier, not the open tier, you've got to kind of go through their um, online uh, form you can fill out a form to try to get to ask for approval um, I'm showing you some of the details in here there's some forms you have to have for you have to create an account um, sorry I'm flipping through this a bit quickly but you're gonna go through it more okay um, so I'll just maybe say two quick things about it um, so one is um, there's there's so there's an undertaking that people have to take here to say I, that I won't I promise not to try to re-identify the data. Uh, there's no criminal sanction attached to trying to re-identify. It's still it's still you're expected not to um, try to re-identify ICGC data, uh, and you do also have to be affiliated with uh, an institution and to have them sign off on it as well. Um, Ideally, there could be a way for citizen scientists, et cetera, who don't have an affiliation to gain access, but uh, legally there hasn't been a way figured out to make that work yet. Um, so just raising a bit of what you end up agreeing to through this, maybe I'll go through it also quickly if Francis is talking about it more. But you see a lot of the things we've been talking about. So there's, there's guidelines about how to use the, the technology. Um, uh, best practice is what your kind of institute, what your academic institution or sign-off authority has to agree to. Uh, they incorporate some of the data sharing principles, including ones I didn't talk about so much, but that kind of come out of those Bermuda principles we mentioned, the uh, Fort Lauderdale principles in 2003 and the Toronto principles of 2009. So you do agree to a, a certain amount of open data. Uh, as far as intellectual property, it's kind of what we mentioned before. They incorporate some uh, best practices and other guidelines from elsewhere. Um, I've got also here some just uh, background information on uh, the experience of the, the Data Access Control Office, uh, which is actually out of my office in, in McGill in Montreal. So quickly at the end here, maybe I'll go through just a quick, um, some aspects of more, more practical virtual machine security and usage best practices um, issues. So security is obviously Separate from privacy, but um, but related. I'm going to be talking about VMs here. So 
I mentioned kind of at the outset the way the way this uh, works technically is you fire up a virtual machine um, and then connect to it uh, through an, the idea is through an encrypted channel so that no one else can listen and gain access. Uh, it's possible to to connect by SSH using a kind of username password standard approach. Uh, it's good to avoid that when possible for a number of reasons, especially if you're uh, working within a team where you don't know what other people's passwords are going to be. Um, so there's a way to actually develop. Um, oh, sorry. So I, the way that the, the uh, slide is set up here it makes it out that password only authentication is distinct from SSH, but you can actually use uh, SSH with passwords. But what we want to do here is have a, what you end up with SSH in any case is you have um, you're using encryption keys essentially to connect. So you have a public key and public and private key pairs. Uh, we, you can develop, we want to, to build strong keys, and we, the, the SSH ends up being convenient if you want to use a number of services. So the general idea of what we're doing here is we want to connect two computers together through a secure encrypted channel. One side is going to be basically your laptop today. The other side is going to be your virtual machine running on. This is the logo, logo for the, uh, the collaboratory. In between them is the internet, so a bunch of people you might not trust who can potentially listen in. So this is why you want the encryption. On your machine, what you're going to be doing a little later today is um, generating a, a private key. Out of that is derived a public key. We need to securely then um, communicate the public key to uh, to the virtual to actually um, to the collaboratory in order so that you can start the communication. We we have a way. I mean, you might have noticed that the the key is going over the public internet. Uh, but we do have a way to be sure that it ends up at the right destination and not at some malicious hackers uh, in some malicious hackers' hands. Although it is it, because it's the public key, anyone can have access to it through the magic then of SSH um, and the key. Uh, there's a key exchange process. You can create an SSH tunnel, which is essentially um, so your communications are still obviously passing between the two, but they're encrypted so no one can read them. We're mostly going to be, I think, just opening up an SSH terminal window to execute commands, but it's also possible through this to do things like transfer files. Uh, I don't think we're going to be transferring files because part of the idea also is that it's much easier to be um, analyzing gen this genomic data on the cloud where there, we have a lot of compute power rather than our local machines. Uh, you can, in theory, also run remote desktop, etc., over the SSH tunnel, but as I understand, that's not what we're doing. So um, here's kind of an example of something almost like what you'll see with the web. The web um, kind of interface to firing up instances in virtual machines with, I mean, this is just a command prompt, but it will be some kind of interface. Um, so you're going to click connect over a certain port. Um, it's a good idea to have uh, the listening on a, the SSH server in general. Uh, I'm not sure how it'll be happening today, but listening on a, on a random port in the dynamic range through uh, this set of ports I've got here. Uh, the idea is then uh, it's maybe that's a small amount of security in the sense that if you avoid standard ports, someone, uh, an attacker might not know to look at the port, your, uh, the port that you actually have your server running on. I wouldn't necessarily 100% rely on that alone as a security mechanism. Um, and then you want to have your firewall blocking as many possible of the remaining ports, unless it's, something, unless it's for services that you need and trust. And then Mentioning that I mentioned the private key before, that's what you want to especially limit access to either physically, you never want to put it online. There are cases where, I mean, you can do searches on Google and find people's private keys. It's not, not a good thing you want to have happen. The public key, the, the way the magic of SSH works is that that's public. Anyone can read it without, uh, without problems. Um, and then an ongoing way, um, if, you, if you have people you're working with and you've shared your keys, it's good to replace them, regenerate them. Uh, it's a good idea to shut down your virtual machine whenever not in use, both for, both for security reasons, but also if you have something running that you're not aware of and it's eating up a whole bunch of cycles and you're going to end up getting a giant bill for it, which once in a while, I mean, I've heard stories of you know professors complaining about, oh, I had this postdoc that just left the machine on and we got a giant bill for thousands of dollars. Um, and then beyond this, I mean, this is a quick overview, but it's good to consult further uses uh, and resources and there's ways to harden uh, security configurations further. Uh, I was mentioned, trying to mention this before, but it's good to prohibit password-only SSH connections and to use a kind of key-based one. 
And when you see warnings, it's good to make sure you understand them. So for example, here's one that's trying to avoid a man in the middle attack um, to try to make sure that the, the machine you're trying to form a connection to is actually the machine that you, um, that you, that you want to connect to. Um, and then I've got the start of the, uh, just kind of a picture of the, the ICGC policy for controlled data access data. Uh, and so this policy has specific guidance on a number of other issues. Obviously, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm not going to go through them, but um, some for local infrastructure, but some for cloud-specific issues, including uh, guidance for specific providers, depending what company you're going through. Uh, and the last thing I might say, I also realize I'm the last thing standing between you and lunch, I believe, is um, audits and accountability are also provided for in the, in the policy document, and there, it's, it's important in an ongoing way. Because you don't want to necessarily only consider security risks when establishing a new system, partly because your system is going to develop over time, but also because vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities come up all the time, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, it's good when possible to have a certified auditor reviewing what, um, your system um, and to regularly review your keys. So yeah, as I said, not only does your project evolve, so does the state of data security as well as best practices. So. Um, Looks like there's 10 minutes left if people had questions or if people were dying for me to go over the Australia example that I mostly, well, I, guess I mostly did talk about it, but otherwise maybe lunchtime.